Hey, Kathy, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Jay. I'm looking forward to it. So I'm really excited to have you today. I was, I was reading through uh, your bio and things that your company does. Um, selfishly, you know, I told my wife when I first started this podcast a couple of years ago that if nobody ever listened to it, uh, it would be really helpful for me because I get to talk to all some other business owners. Exactly. Thankfully, other people do listen now, but uh, it's still helpful to me. Every episode, I learn something and I hope people that listen do as well. So when looking at your bio, you know, one of the things that stood out to me is, is you spent uh, quite a while with the career and, and, and jobs working for other companies and other people. Mm -hmm. And now you have run the company that you run now for nearly two decades. Uh, so you started your own thing and, and you ventured out. I'd love to hear a little bit about that, what that transition was like going from working for someone to kind of being your own boss and, and why you made some of those decisions. Good questions. How long do we have? No, I'll keep it, I'll keep it short. But um, I, I feel, um, uh, I, I believe very little in luck, so, but I will use the word fortunate, okay? I feel very fortunate. Uh, I did have, you know, 20 some year career in corporate America. Uh, I came up through the bell system. Probably most of your listeners are too young to appreciate what that meant when I was coming up through the bell system, but that was when the bell system was at the top of the heap. It was in its heyday. So we had the best development opportunities. We led the quality movement in the United States and on and on and on. And I was in the thick of all of that. So the uh, opportunities and the experience that I got there were just incredible. So, so that was really great. It was great experience. But I came to a point in my life where um, my parents had some really uh, uh, severe illnesses and I was traveling 80% of the time all over the world. And so that just wasn't working. And again, I was mature enough in my career. I was an executive to feel comfortable enough, you know, to walk away from that and, you know, let the chips fall where they may, if you will. So I did that and probably went for about 10 months, not really doing much of anything except taking care of them, getting through that time. And then um, another friend of mine who was an executive in the Bell System and then at General Dynamics where we ended our careers uh, had left there and for other personal reasons. And we decided to help each other figure out what we were gonna do next in life because we didn't know. And as it turns out, you know, we, we were, were real planners and uh, analytical folks and, you know, we did all of this analysis and research and all this kind of stuff. And then one day we just kind of looked at each other and said, well, what made us successful in our corporate careers? What do we do well? And what we really did well, which was pretty simple, as we were really good at setting a vision and inspiring people to it, we could see the potential in people greater than they can see it in themselves and help them to aspire to that and to, to reach that to their greater potential. I mean, that was the key to our success, the keys to our success. So we said, okay, so we could start a business doing that. And so that really is how we started the Latitude Group uh, back in 2002. And Latitude, if people look at it, has three T's in it. So we have attitude in our latitude. So it's all about, you know, attitude, inspiration, people development, and, you know, strategy, helping business, businesses get to where they need to be for the right reasons. I love that. Uh, just such a cool story of, of making that transition and obviously doing it successfully. And, and the thing that really stands out to me there too is, is ultimately that question that you asked was kind of, you know, where are our strengths exactly. and how can we help other people? Right. And, and I think so many times it's easy for people to get stuck on what their weaknesses are and where they're struggling and where their faults are because we've all got plenty of those. And instead ask that question, like, where are your strengths? I love the question that's on your homepage, actually. Where can your company take you? Yeah. Like that's, a, that's a very powerful question for somebody who's, I mean, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. I started my business when I was 17. We've been in business 21 years. But even still now, I look at that question and go, that's a good question for me 21 years ago. And it's a good question for me today. Absolutely. Um, so when you crafted that idea of like, where can your company take you? Tell me a little bit about that. Like, what's your thought process behind that? What do you want people to be digging into in their thought process before they consider, you know, working with somebody like Latitude? 
Well, right up front, we actually talk to people about why are you working here? Why are you doing this? Do you have even stopped to think about it? And what do you want to get out of it? You know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, where do you want to be in your life? Do you want to be taking a, a, a month off and taking an RV trip across the country with your family or retiring someplace or sending your kids to college or you know, there's there's a whole lot of things. You want to be selling this business, turning it over to somebody else. What is it that you want? You know, and, and along the way, how do you want to get there? So one thing is about where you want to get to, and the other thing is how do you want to get there? That's about the values, okay? And yeah, what are you willing to do or not willing to do to get there? So so we have to establish those things first. And so many people think about being, I think you know, being uh, somewhat, the, the company is running them. Mm. Or they're somehow subservient to the company when it should be the other way around, right? What, what, what can we do with this company that's of value to us and to other people for now and for the long run? Um, and so that's what I mean by where can your company take you? I think, you know, the first thing we start with is where, what do you, where do you want to be owner, where do you want to be business leader? And now let's, and, and what's important to you about how you get there, then we can help you put together the plan to get there. And the tools and the processes to do that, I say they're pretty simple. I mean, we have good ones, but I'm just saying, right. you know, it, it, once people get that clarity, it's much easier than to be about that hard work because it is hard work. Yeah, I think, you know, What's interesting to me is I hear you talk about those things of, of thinking about where you want to go and then how you're going to get there um, and what that means for you as a leader or an owner or founder or whatever uh, your title might be is I think for a long time, I felt really selfish asking those questions. I felt wow. like, you know, I had some kind of a, I was almost ruinously empathetic to some extent towards the team. And what I've realized now is it's in everyone's best interest if I am no longer materially needed by the company at some point. Absolutely. Not because I want to leave, not because I love what I do. I love this company. I love this team. I love our clients, love the work that we get to do. But, you know, if I were to not be here tomorrow for Lord knows what reason, what happens to everybody else? And, and I've realized now especially after coming, I've had a lot of reflection time being 30 days in an RV um, with five kids. Uh, and, and, and I go, wow, I'd love to create opportunities like that for everybody else too. But the only way I can do that is if, if I'm already in a place where I'm capable of doing it. It's like putting your oxygen mask on first. Well, I love that phrase that you used, which I never heard of, but uh, ruinously empathetic. Mm -hmm. I, we, we coach business leaders both on the strategy and the people development side on that all the time. Never use that term. I will now though, since you gave it to me, yeah. but, but that concept about, you know, getting down to, you know, kind of the tough love and, and all of those kind of things and getting to the point I had one of the great mentors and I was fortunate to have a ton of great mentors, mm. particularly throughout my corporate career. And I had this one boss who said to me when I came to the first day that I interviewed with him, he said, now here's the deal. He said, your job is to work yourself out of a job. Mm. Your job is to get this to be so good that they don't need that, but we don't need this position anymore. And he said, I promise you, my pledge to you is if you do that, I will make sure that you land better than you are today. And I watched him over the years because that did happen for me. And I kept up that relationship. I watched him do that over and over and over again. And we do that with our clients. We're not looking for our clients to be dependent on us forever. Mm -hmm. okay? We do have a long track record. Our clients stay with us a pretty long while, but we're still looking to get them to that point of being able to pretty much independently do most of what we do, particularly in the early stages. Yeah. And, um, you know, one thing you said there that really stood out to me was the idea of having great mentors. And you said you were fortunate to have a lot of great mentors over the years. Um, I'd love to hear a little more about that. You know, how did you come across those mentors? Um, how did you kind of pour into those relationships or how did those relationships pour into you? And how important is that for the entrepreneur who is out there trying to run their own business? Well, there's a lot to unpack in there, but it's a great question. First thing, let me say for me that when I first came into corporate America, 
All right, I was a kid that grew up in a rural farming community down in North Carolina where nobody ever went to college. And that doesn't mean there weren't very fine, intelligent people there, right? But they didn't have that education experience and they didn't have that business experience, nor did I. So I walked into corporate America sort of with my jaw dropping day one because I didn't have a clue, right? And my very first boss was a guy, believe it or not, super businessman, but he was in the twilight of his career mm. and he had seven children, seven grown children. He had seen everything there was to see <laughs> about young people getting started, et cetera. And that was perfect for yeah. me. He used to say to me, you know, Kathy, you're just full of piss and vinegar. <laughs> but he knew how to handle that because I know that I was a handful. And rather than just, you know, butting heads with me all the time, he mentored me, he brought me along. And that was great. And at each juncture, it seemed like that the right one appeared. Now, I do think that some of that had to do with I was a willing participant. I take feedback. I can handle it. I use it, I grow, I, you know, grew with that. And I think some people could see that. So I think some of those good mentors actually plucked me out, you know, to come work with them because I had that reputation mm. or, you know, whatever the case may be. So I think it's a combination of both. You, you make your own destiny sometimes, you know, just by being willing to do that. But at different junctures, I had one boss. This is a great story. I was the, uh, the uh, CFO for a business unit in AT&T. And someone years ago before I came onto the scene had bought some stock and we needed to sell that stock. I didn't know anything about that. And my boss said, you gotta sell the stock. I said, okay. So <laughs> I'm talking to these investment bankers and all these people on Wall Street at six or seven o'clock at night. And he comes walking into my office one night at six o'clock and I got all these people and I'm like, get in here, get in here, I need some help, you know, and he said, see ya, and he left, <laughs> and you know, that was a, a developmental moment, he, he was yes. basically saying, I have confidence in you, you can handle this, yes, and I did, <laughs> you know? so at different junctures, I had different people that were right for the, you know, the, that point in time, you know, for me, I love, I love that story so much because one of the things that I always say is my responsibility as CEO is to create an environment where this sounds crazy, but it's true. Create an environment where people have the opportunity to fail, just not fail catastrophically. Absolutely. And, and I saw, I saw a similar story of somebody on, on a LinkedIn one time and they were saying it was the same kind of thing where somebody would basically, they were like, I really need some help. And they're like, no, you don't, you've got it. Uh, no, no, I remember what it was. The, the story was uh, somebody was leaving a job, taking all, over a role of somebody who had been very successful mm -hmm. in this particular role. And they were kind of have a, having a parting advice for the person that was leaving. And, and they said, and, and they said, hey, well, if I run into any trouble, can I call you, you know, and you can help me answer any questions? And, and they said, no, you can't, you've got it. And, and they said that was the best thing that person could have ever said to them because they realized the reality is we're all kind of figuring it out as we go along the way and we have other people and resources to lean on, but there's something about somebody going, no, 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 I believe you have this and our system is strong enough to endure even if you make a mistake. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, I coach people all the time and people who would used to come to me and say, oh, we have this you know, problem or whatever, you know, what are we going to do? And I look at them and say, well, what, what would you do? Yeah. What, what do you think is the right thing to do? And nine times out of 10, I would say, sounds good to me. Why don't you go do that? <laughs> you know, every once in a while you have to, you know, massage that a little bit. But, you know, most of the decisions we make, there's not just one right answer. And if, if it's not exactly the perfect answer, it's not catastrophic. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what I love about that, too, is, you know, I used to always believe sayings like, and this is, just not true. If you want it done right, and you got to do it yourself. Uh, it's just not yeah. true. And especially exactly. if, you're not gonna, if you're gonna build a successful, scalable team and scalable business, you have to be able to let other people do it. And, and that's, I, one, somebody told me a long time ago, they said, look, if one of your team members brings you a problem, tell them don't bring me a problem without a possible solution. Absolutely. Now, it might be a bad solution and that's fine. But some, and sometimes even as a leader, if you think you have a better idea, but their idea is not catastrophic, it's better to just let them try their idea 
Um, and I, but I have, that took me, I still, I still struggle with that because I just want to be like, well, just do this instead. Um, but that, that's not going to help them grow half the time. That's correct. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit selfish because um, you have so much knowledge and uh, I think this will be helpful for everybody, but it's something that I'm working on right now. And I figure, well, I might as well ask you because um, you know, you'll know these things. Uh, one of the things that stage wise that we're at as a business right now is I feel like we've been, I've been very successful. The company has been very successful at building a team that's very good at serving our clients well and doing the work really well. And so one of the things that I'm working on in my level of personal growth right now as a leader is now developing other leaders. Cause I feel like that's kind of the step. You got to build a team. Now you got to build a team of leaders and that's where I'm at. There may be a lot of other business owners out there that maybe they're in the same place. They're the leader. They've got a lot of other team members. What's some advice you might give to me and to other people out there that are listening that are going, Hey, I need to, I need to start empowering and building up some other leaders on my team. What, what would you say to those people? Well, I think that, that one thing, it, it, it's a great thought to have and it's the right thought. So that's the, that's the beginning, just the awareness that, that we need to do that is the right thing to do, but that's not enough. And the next thing is you need to get intentional about it. You need to get intentional about looking at your people, finding out, first of all, what's important to them. You know, what are their, their goals? What do they want to aspire to? Now, sometimes they limit themselves. It's just <clears throat> like something I said earlier. You know, I would sit down and talk to people and they'd say, oh, well, I, you know, I want to do X, Y, Z. And I'm thinking, well, and they, they say, you know, I want to do UVW. And I'm thinking you can do X, Y, Z. <laughs> You're so much better. And right. so, you know, you have so much more potential. So, so you start having those kind of conversations. And then you look at, okay, you're here now, but to get there, what, what needs to happen? And, and you start building out that plan. And it can be loose or it can be very formal and structured. It depends on you know, what you're aspiring to, what is called for in the situation. Some people need a really big structured plan. Other people need a guide, you know, mm -hmm. some steps to take. And I think that's okay. And then you look to create opportunities as a leader for those leaders. Knowing what they're aspiring to, is there a special project that I can hand to this person that, that you know, that they can, that they can lead? Or, you know, is there, you know, there are all kinds of, of opportunities, um, <clears throat> a team that we need to put together that I'll make them the team leader of. Yeah. Or uh, one of the things that we do, most of our clients establish strategic planning teams. We want a strategic planning team that has some people across the organization, Jay. So clients that we have, and our clients stay with us on the average of four and a half years. So we go through about four planning cycles with each one of those, one a year. And so we will rotate people in and out of that strategic planning team as a development opportunity. Now certainly they have to be people who can contribute to the process, but, but looking for opportunities like that. So you get intentional, you look for that, you have dialogue. And the other thing is you want to make sure that they are as committed to their success as you are. Mm. Okay. Um, it's a mistake for you to care more about someone's success than they do. Yeah. It leads to bad behaviors and bad outcomes usually. Mm. Yeah, that is, um, a lesson I have learned the hard way sometimes is you can yeah. want something for somebody else, but unless they want it, you, right. you're just spinning your wheels. And, and at the end of the day, you, you can't, um, you can't will your will into somebody else. You know, right. they have to have that innate desire. And, and that's, that's been hard for me along the way. Cause I go, man, I can, I can see where you could go and I can see what you could do. And they go, yeah, but I don't want that. Like, the one other thing I would like to say before, if, if we get rid of the leave of this topic, okay. when, when an organization gets to that point that you're talking about to thinking about, you know, the building, the leaders and the next leaders and, and developing people, that's not just about what I just now talked about. It needs to be, become a part of the culture so mm. that everybody knows that that's important to this company, this business, and its leaders and its owners now. And that in, in and of itself uh, helps the culture. People who work for companies that they believe have their best interest at heart and are looking to help them to develop and to move forward and to accomplish things important to them in their lives. That's why it's so important to ask people the question, what's important? Mm. 
because if we don't know what's important to people, we don't know how to help them get to where they want and they will be less inspired to help us get where we need to be. Yeah. I mean, that's such a good question. Uh, and I, I'm asking myself now, like when was the last time I asked that question to my team? Um, and it's a simple question. What's important? Like what's important to you? Cause what's important to that team member may not be what's important to me. And ultimately my job is to define what is important to the company and what the vision of the company is. But in order to help the individuals, you know, progress on their own path, which is part of my job, uh, I need to know what they, what's actually important to them. Yeah, so I'm, I'm giving you away a great coaching tip here, which is part of my business because a lot of people, you know, you'll say what's important and they'll say, well, what's important about what? Don't clarify that question for them. You mm -hmm. want, you want to come out of that is what's top of mind. And I will tell you that rarely do people say that work is the most important thing to them. Yeah. For sure. I mean, yeah. and, and, and I think it changes too. I mean, it's certainly changed for me in different seasons of life. When I had sure. no kids and wasn't married, what's important is a different question now that I've got five kids and um, would like to stay married to the same woman my whole life. Those are different uh, priorities. and Absolutely. Um, it kind of breaks down to that. So I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, practically how, how you guys work with clients. I notice on your website, you've got like different plans. You've got kind of day one, day two, day three. Here's, here's how the executions work out. Who's an ideal client for you and, and what are you going to do along the way to help them kind of progress on their journey? Okay. So the ideal client for the Latitude Group, interestingly enough, given the time that I and my former business partners were in corporate America, uh, our ideal client is an number one, an established company. We're not working with startups and that's not because we are too good or wonderful to work with startups. It's just the, the model that we have is not appropriate for startups, okay? Uh, so we're working with established companies that have a goal in mind, privately held, okay? And kind of in the mid-cap range. Now, why are we working with them? Well, first of all, uh, the way that we work, relationship building is important. And you can build relationships across those companies even though you're talking about, you know, some of those companies are 100, 200 million dollar companies. That's not a huge company. That's a, you know, still a small company. And you can have relationships. And when we start having relationships, we can see where we're making a difference every time we touch them, every time we interact. So, so we're working with those kind of companies. And we do start out by, as we just talked about, asking the questions, where do you want to take the company? But then there's another really important uh, qualifier. Okay. It's not just about the budget and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. It's, we talked to that business leader. I mean, let's use you for an example. If we were talking to you about working with your company to develop and execute a strategic business plan. Okay. The first thing we would, one of the things that we would say to you is, okay, Jay, how, how willing are you to lead this effort and to make sure that everybody in this company knows this is a priority? This is a part of their job that's important, that you're being held account, that they're being held accountable to as much as anything else. In other words, we've got the tools. We have the processes. We've been doing this a long time. We know how to do it. Okay, we can come in here and give you all those bells and whistles, okay, to put a beautiful plan together for you. But if you're not leading the charge internally, I can guarantee you it's going to suboptimize at best, all right, yeah. and maybe not even be very successful. The other thing that we're going to say to you is you have to make a commitment to uh, be on this journey for at least a year with us, okay, which means that we're going to go through execution. Once we get this plan established, the minute the ink dries on the plan, and we can talk more about that, we don't give you a book. We give you one page front to back that has your business plan on it. We've got everything else in a project management tool. People go online, they work at their stuff. We can, and then we can look at it with them and help them if they need it. You know, but every month we're going to get together and have a business review. Now that doesn't mean things don't happen off schedule. If they need our advice, they call us up, they text or, you know, email, whatever they need to do. And we work that issue. But every month we have a scheduled business review. We're looking at financials, we're looking at the business plan, what's working, what's not working, what do we need to adjust? That's a simplification that's happening. So that's a commitment that we're, we're saying to people to make. Those are big things up front that if you're not willing to do those things, so you're investing a lot of resources, 
time, energy, money, all of which is money in my world, but, sure. <laughs> but nonetheless. And so those are the kind of dialogues that we're having to get that going. Uh, we're going to tour facilities if you have major facilities. We're going to have interviews with people across the business before we get started. I guarantee, I don't care how open your door is as the head of the company, if there, there are things that people down in the company know or insights they have that you don't know. Mm-hmm. And we can very quickly get them there. We're honest brokers. We're authentic people. That's really important that people know that and can trust you. And that's what happens. Um, that's so good. And everybody that's listening or, or watching, uh, one thing very specific that I want you to note is that Kathy had no hesitation in telling me exactly who her ideal client was. Um, that seems silly, but I meet a lot of people sometimes who I say, well, what's your ideal client? And they're like, well, it's kind of anybody. And I'm like, no, it's definitely not no, anybody. Not. <laughs> um, and so that's problem number one. If, if you say your ideal client is anybody, uh, you need to work on that probably right before you do anything else. But that idea of going, hey, and it's interesting because we, we have a lot of the same qualifiers uh, for ideal clients for us. And, and it is interesting. We, we kind of are the same way we'd prefer an established company over a startup. We're not, we won't totally exclude a startup because there are instances where we can help them. Um, but a lot of times I want to know that somebody knows how to run their business and we're just coming alongside them to help them grow in the marketing and sales sides, which is what we're experts at. Um, super interesting. Uh, one of the things that I always ask people um, on these shows is I want to talk about work-life balance a little bit. Uh, it means something completely different to everybody, and I think it changes through different seasons of life. Um, but I'd love to hear from you, number one, what does that even mean to you, work-life balance? And number two, how, how has that changed through different seasons of your life? Oh, boy, that's a great question to ask me. <laughs> uh, I've struggled with it. Even though, again, I coach it and I talk to people about it. Uh, We're not going to tell my age here, but I come from the generation where, you know, work was number one. I mean, to give you an example, I had great parents. My parents were great parents. They loved us tremendously, uh, my brother and I. However, you did not call, we did not call our parents at work Mm -hmm. unless it was a dire emergency. Okay, you didn't call them just to say, oh, I just got so-and-so at school, you know, something happened, I made an A on this test, or, you know, whatever. You didn't do that, right? So, you know, that, so that's ingrained to me, you know, you, you work hard, and, you know, we come from that background. So, early in my career, too, being a woman in business, and this was true, Jay, uh, to accomplish what I accomplished, I was as smart as the, as the next guy, Mm-hmm. Uh, etc. But I always had to go more functions, worked mm-hmm. harder, longer, etc. And 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 I'm not blaming anyone else. I I took that on. I did it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I clearly subordinated, you know, myself in my life, you know, my in the early years, you know, to my career. I worked a lot, mm-hmm. and I was the person that everybody knew. If you wanted to get something done, go to her. You know, it'll it'll happen, and so so that happened, and the, so I didn't even you know so through the the in the next phase of my life I got married, which I got married very late, uh, you know by normal standards, uh, but still was working hard, you know. But I was very good at the, that work around, you know. I could go and be in this waiting room or this line or that kind of work. So always working, but then family did because. Number one, family mm-hmm. first. So and, and so I managed that, but the problem with that was then I went through a phase where yes, family was first. So you know whatever was happening with you know stepkids or whatever the case may be, I was showing up, I was being there, but then I was working half the night, mm-hmm. you know, to compensate for that. So again, it was taking care of everybody else. So family was first, but not me. Yeah. Okay. So you know that looked good from the outside. But that wasn't really so good. Yeah. Uh, and so now uh, I'm really in the place where, um, and, and I have that reputation. I mean, really, it's amazing now to hear people talk about, I talked to someone the other day that I talked to about coming to work with the Latitude Group about a year and a half ago. We're talking again, but she said, at that time, I just didn't think I could keep up with you. You were just too, <laughs> I'm almost like, 
What do you mean? <laughs> and I'm, I'm not saying that, and that's not a good thing. Yeah. Um, and so I really now, it is about, uh, I've, I've hired more people, I'm handing things off. I have something on my, my board, I just erased it so it wouldn't show up in case it got on there. But this little acronym that says uh, CSEDT, can't someone else do this? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really good at developing people and telling you that's not the problem. It's just that I believe that there's just, there's always something to be done. My mind works that way. And letting go of it and spending some time, so I'm just there now, much better at that than I used to be. Although I still get this if I go a weekend and I'm not on email, someone says, is everything okay? We didn't hear from you this week. <laughs> But, but I do think it is really important, and I'll be honest with you, I hear people saying, and every generation has done this, don't get me wrong, about the new generation coming along, oh, that, you know, there's something wrong, you know, there's always something wrong with the new generation, correct? Yeah. That's coming along. And so, you know, now they think they just don't want to work, or they're not committed, or this kind of stuff. I love the new generation. They have boundaries. I coach people on boundaries all the time. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They, they still work hard. They work smart, but they have other things that are important. And I really coach about boundaries now, and I work on that for myself. So I think work-life balance is about finding out again what's important to you and setting boundaries around those. It's not the same for everybody. Yeah, I just agree with that so much. And that, that's what I, oh, I always like asking the question because I think it's interesting to hear how people, it's just different for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, right now, I think culturally, especially in the United States, we seem to be on this like extreme uh, path for everything. Everything is either way over here or way over here. We can't seem to settle on anything that's anywhere close to the middle. Uh, we won't get into politics today. Um, and, and so what happens, I think, is this happens with work-life balance. And you have this crowd over here that says, if you're not working 18 hours a day, you're hardly working. Right. And you got this crowd over here that says, if you're not taking a three-hour lunch break and doing two hours of yoga a day, you're not getting enough rest. Right. And I don't... I think either one of those, those things could actually be true for those people. Like maybe that's where they want to live their life and that's okay. And that's the beauty of choosing. But I think it is worth asking the question of like, where, where am I right now? How do I feel today? Am I sacrificing my own sanity for everyone else around me? One of my kind of aspirational identities is a guy named Michael Hyatt. He's an author that I really love. And, um, and he, when he talks about his priority list, he actually puts himself at the top. And he says, when he talks about it, he's like, people see this as like a selfish thing when I list this out, because most people put like, God, my family, myself, my team, whatever. And he's like, I put me, God, or maybe he puts like God, me, my family, but he puts his himself above basically everybody else. And, and his, his point in that is essentially, if I don't take care of myself and whatever I happen to need in that season, some seasons that might need be more exercise. Some seasons that might be better eating. Sometimes that might be more sleep. Some seasons might be working all the time because some of us that are pure-blooded entrepreneurs, we actually like to work. Exactly. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that either. So I just Happy love hearing that. that perspective and going, hey, I'm, trying, I'm still learning. You know. The key, is, the key is that you choose, not someone else chooses. Mm. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if, if I'm choosing my path, that's fine. I want to back up um, a little bit because there was one topic I meant to hit on and we didn't talk about it that much, but you, you kind of talked about it briefly and I want to go back to it. Um, so three kind of parting things that I want to get to here. Number one is going to be about team culture or company culture. Uh, number two is going to be kind of parting advice that you might have for people about building a business that lasts. And number three is just going to be where people can find you. So that's the easiest question. Sure. So number one, let's talk about culture just for a few minutes. Um, that's an often used word that I don't think people always even know what it means or what they mean by it. Sometimes they just mean like, you know, team lunches and bean bags. Um, so when you say cultural cult, culture development on a team, what do you mean by culture? And, and what are some strategies people can do to have a better culture uh, on their team or at their companies? Well, when I think about culture, I think about standards and norms in, in, in a business, the values, the standards, the norms. And, you know, people understanding that, you know, what that means in that company. And so I, I am a proponent 
uh, then we do it in our planning process. We don't sit around and contemplate our navel all day and we don't wordsmith values and things like that in session. There's a way to get there without doing that, actually a better way. Uh, but defining your values, and, 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 and it's a short list because those are unequivocals. But it's then about living those values, putting them out there and being upfront about it. I have to tell you, uh, I've seen clients that say, oh, we're going to have workshops about culture. And they have these workshops about culture and they're well-intentioned and they're good content, Jay, but then they don't go out and live them. Now, nobody's perfect, right? People are going to make mistakes. If, if we have values established, somebody's going to violate one of those values here and there. Don't get me wrong. But the deal is that you're sincerely and authentically trying to live those and role model those day in and day out. People know the difference. So it's about identifying them, living them, holding people accountable to it. It's pretty simple. I think we try to overcomplicate it. And you know, it's just it's just pretty simple. I mean, I can remember as an executive that had HR reporting to me in corporate America, and one day someone came in, one of my reports, and they wanted to create a policy for something that had happened. And I said, well, you know, what's the probability that's ever going to happen again? And it's pretty low. I said, well, you know, do we really need a policy? I said, what do you think the right thing to do here is? And they said, blah, 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 blah. And I said, okay, I said, that sounds good to me. Just go do it. He said, well, he, and he said, well, we can't do that. And I said, are you telling me we can't do the right thing? And I mean, honestly, that's like, that's a really simple example of what culture is all about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it's, it's people. Sometimes it's about using common sense in carrying out and executing on your values. You know, it, it doesn't have to be reciting them you know, all the time, putting them out there like a badge of honor. Be careful about doing that because it'll come back to bite you. It's just about authentically living it. And if you stub your toe, authentically owning up to it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that. You know, I used to always think that things like outlining values and, and stuff was a corporate -y thing to do. Um, but I realized a lot of those things are needed and perfectly fine for uh, young yeah thriving entrepreneurs as well. And in fact, needed at some point, you got to put things down and go, no, this is, this is what we believe in. And then at, at points, give people the opportunity to challenge that. So it says we believe this, but do we? Because this is how we act. Exactly. So that's a different question altogether. Um, so uh, as we think about the idea of building a business that lasts, something that's going to sustain through time as, as the Latitude Group has, um, what is some parting advice that, that you'd want to speak into other entrepreneurs and business leaders today to go, hey, here's some things you need to think about if you want to build a business that lasts? Well, a few things. One is that you do need to start on a firm financial foundation. Even if you're an entrepreneur, we tell people to be prepared if you're starting a brand new business from scratch to go without a paycheck for a year, maybe 18 months. Okay. Uh, and, 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 you know, and have some uh, pretty good foundation. And then the other thing is to maintain that solid financial foundation. You know, we just went into this pandemic, which caught a lot of people flat footed. People didn't have reserves. The same thing happened back in 2008. Okay. But the companies that were left standing on the other side of that, for the most part, were the ones that were not too heavily leveraged and uh, that had a pretty solid financial foundation. So, so I know everybody says, oh, well, you're that CFO and all you care about are the numbers. The truth of the matter is if the numbers don't work, no one else does. Okay, so, so that's important. Uh, and then from there, I think that people need to understand, it's been my experience, I've been around a long time, that quality and ethics lead to repeat and referral business. Mm -hmm. If you don't deliver a quality uh, product or service ethically, Okay. And the other one, which we, we just never seem to learn this is never get comfortable. Mm. Okay. Doesn't mean you have to be paranoid. You have to be productively paranoid. Yeah. Just one with Jim Collins books, but it's, um, but it's about never getting comfortable. Yeah. I always say, uh, I'm the least comfortable when I'm the most comfortable. Right. Uh, and what I mean by that is that if I'm just like living on perfect comfort, uh, I probably don't know something I need to know, uh, yeah. or I'm not, I'm not, 
pushing the envelope enough to keep things moving That's right. because, you know, we do a ton of stuff now as an agency to help people grow their businesses. But, you know, back in the day, all we did was basic little HTML websites. Well, if right. that's all we still did today, that wouldn't work very well. Exactly. Uh, so we've had to constantly change and adapt. And I think people have to be used to that. So I love that you said that, uh, never be comfortable. Quality and ethics ultimately equals sustainability. Um, and if the numbers don't work, neither do neither does anybody else. I think that's that right. is just really sound counsel. Uh, Kathy, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Where can people find more about you and Latitude Group online? The, the, the place to go is, is our website, which is www.latitudegroup.com. We have everything there about what we do, how to get in touch with us. If you want a free consultation, there's all kinds of places where you can just click a button and schedule that, which we would love to talk to people. Uh, so, and, and also, we're just putting a guide out there right now with questions that business owners and leaders need to be asking themselves right now as they're, as they're moving through you know, this pandemic and looking to the future, which is very, very uncertain for everybody. Absolutely. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's been a pleasure. I know I've learned a lot. I think everybody else has too. And uh, I will put the link to your website in the show notes. Everybody has access to it. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Hey, I hope this video has helped you with some tips and ideas to build a business that lasts. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss out on the next videos that we roll out. And more importantly, for some awesome free resources, head over to our website at buildingabusinessthatlasts.com. You can get a free copy of my book there where I tell you how I have built an agency that's grown year over year for the last 20 years in a row. So go grab that, buildingabusinessthatlasts.com, and make sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks. We'll see you soon.